start talking about the Cold War. Before I get into the details of that, though, I do want to give you guys a little idea about where we are in the course. Because uh, I taught Jonathan's sections on Wednesday. And the very first section, I started this way by just asking, so is this course making sense to you? And every single person in that section said no, <laughs> which concerned me a little. <laughs> So anyway, I thought I should remind you of where we are, because I haven't been talking a lot about the big picture. I've been talking about the details, and we've been throwing ourselves into certain historical circumstances, or literary works, or philosophical works, and I haven't done much big picture reflection. So let me do a little bit of that right at the outset. For those of you who were in that section, or the other sections, you've seen this already, but for those of you who weren't, maybe this will be helpful. The main theme of this course really is normativity. And so it has to do with the question of, well, you might say, the ought, the should, the good, the bad, <laughs> um, other things that express values, right, wrong, just, unjust, etc. All of that, and the stats of those things. The initial puzzle arises in the Enlightenment, where it looks as if science has this ability to describe the world completely, and yet you might think, well, when it describes it, it's purely describing. In short, it's giving us a world full of is, and yet these odds aren't, aren't there in any way, yet they seem real. And so we've talked about the significance of two-level theories, where basically the is is down here, and the odds are all up there. This is what I call the manifest image, this surface-level description of the world, and here is this underlying hidden image, or picture, that is supposed to be describing uh, what's really going on in the world and what explains things at the surface level. Well, there's plenty of description here too, but notice the odds are all up here, they're not down there. And so the question is really, well, what happens to these then? If the world can ultimately be understood strictly in terms of description without any evaluation, what's the rule of values? And so I, what I did is draw for them a certain Dow Jones, Dow Jones Industrial Average chart with respect to normativity. You might say, look, throughout the 19th century, it took a long time for the, this sort of enlightenment paradox to really arise and make itself felt. So throughout the 19th century, values were still doing pretty well, but they started coming under pressure from the Industrial Revolution, from the doubts of people like Matthew Arnold and then Friedrich Nietzsche, and then, of course, right around 1900, let's say, the cynicism of people like Shaw and others who were influenced by these movements, but it wasn't until the First World War that they really, in general, had <laughs> swept down rid of lost a lot of the ground. So let's call that World War I that saw such a collapse. And then belief in values remains at a kind of low level throughout the 20s and 30s, hence this sort of inability of anybody to respond to the various challenges of the 1930s. But then World War II happened. And the story had gone, look, it was these values that got us into trouble that led the world into war. Maybe if we gave up all of this belief in values, if we gave up the shoulds, the oughts, and so on, then actually it would be a peaceful world. People wouldn't have anything to fight and to die for. And the result of that was actually much more destruction than people had been able to imagine, even after World War I. World War II then led people to think, wait, we can't do without these concepts both because it was in part the unwillingness to use them that kept us paralyzed and led to war, but partly also because of a sense that the war just posed really difficult questions. And it wasn't enough to say, uh, I'm cynical about what I ought to do. The question is, Bob, these people are not. <laughs> um, hundreds of thousands of lives might like, hang in the balance of one single decision or whether to fight or not to fight, whether to bomb or not to bomb. And so people had to in a sense, take these questions seriously. So we begin to see a revival. But then, there are really many different paths, many different ways in which norms, values, might be resuscitated. And so what we're in now is really a part of the course here, let's say, um, where we're trying to trace how that's being done, what people's ideas are for rebuilding a sense of value after the destruction of the war, and after a sense that doing without them was even worse than having, having them around. So we're going to take a look today at some attempt to revive values. We already looked at the existentialists. We've looked at Murdoch and her platonic idea of the good calling to us. We've looked at C.S. Lewis and his insistence that values are objective and have to be uncovered from the structure of the world. 
And we've looked at Borges and his worry that if you take a certain perspective on time and on your own action, feel that you're not free, then yes, you're going to do monstrous things. So partly what's required is a recognition of your own freedom and the sense that things do make a difference. Well, today we're going to look at a confrontation of a different kind with two different ways, you might say, of rebuilding norms after the war. The roots of the Cold War were really sown before the end of World War II. There was a Tehran conference in 1943 where Roosevelt, Churchill, and Stalin met, and Churchill was very worried. In fact, one top British diplomat put it this way, Stalin has got the president in his pocket. There was a concern that in these discussions already by 1943, Roosevelt was taking Stalin's side against Churchill for a vision of what the end of the war was to look like and what the post-war world would be like. The Yalta Conference in 1945 was an even more dramatic example of that. This is FDR speaking about Stalin. I think that if I give him everything I possibly can and ask nothing from him in return, no less oblige, he won't try to annex anything and will work with me for a world of democracy and peace. Well, you probably already know enough about Stalin to know that this was an insane thought. <laughs> Stalin had no interest in democracy, no interest in peace. And the idea of trusting him in this way was really very little short of insane. But that sort of alliance with Stalin and against Churchill in these discussions ended up leading to the post-war world. Here you see a picture of those three leaders at Yalta. You see Churchill there on the left, Roosevelt in the center, and then Stalin there on the right surrounded in the back by various dignitaries and high officials from those various countries. Here you see another picture of the three, one where it's a little hard to imagine what's going on, <laughs> but it looks like Stalin's telling a joke. Uh, in any case, somebody photoshopped <laughs> that image to include the empty girl. Uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> Yosho was actually a very serious thing occurring near the end of the, of the European war, and it's really where at Yalta, the Allies mapped out a detailed plan for what was to occur after the war. Throughout this whole process, Roosevelt refused to coordinate in any way with Churchill. It would have been natural for the two leaders to get together, or at least to communicate in advance, to develop a certain strategy. They did not do that. He did not back Churchill's demand for international supervision of Polish elections. Remember that the war started with the German invasion of Poland and in September of 1939, the Russians had at that point moved in from the east, and Germany and Russia had split Poland between them. Well, now that the war was ending, what was that to happen with Poland? It was entirely by this point under Russian control because the Russian army had swept through Eastern Europe, pushing the Germans back. The British and the Americans had been advancing from the west, and so they ended up splitting Germany between them. Very frustratingly to Eisenhower, who was ready to advance on Berlin, he was ordered by the president to stop at the Elbe River and allow Stalin's troops to go over and take over what became East Germany. And so a substantial amount of this was really, as it were, given by Britain and really Franklin Roosevelt to Stalin uh, in order to split Germany in some way. But Poland then was entirely under Russian control. What was to happen to it? Churchill insisted that Poland should regain its status as an independent country and that there should be free elections. Well, he insisted this had, there had to be international supervisors for that election to guarantee that it was free. That didn't happen. In fact, Roosevelt not only didn't go along with that, he announced that all US forces would be out of Europe within two years. Now, that was sort of carte blanche. Suppose you tell your enemy, We're, we've got troops there now, but all troops will be withdrawn within Two years, let's say. What does the enemy do? They just wait two years, right? <laughs> it's like, yes, you're going to be gone in two years. Fine, we'll do that. So, inevitably throughout history, this sort of an announcement of a date, a timetable for withdrawal is a mistake. You've got to keep the enemy uncertain about what you're going to do. In this case, Russia knew that within two years, all American troops would be withdrawn. Actually, that didn't happen because of subsequent events. There's still American troops in Germany. But that, at least, was what Roosevelt had promised. And then he went along with the Russian idea. Molotov, the foreign minister, announced that Polish elections would be held Soviet-style. Now, what is Soviet-style when it comes to elections? 
Uh, too bad I don't want a soundtrack. I'll play you a few bars of Gangnam style or something like that. <laughs> what does Soviet style mean? Well, it meant more or less the winners are selected in advance, and then the ballot boxes are stuffed in such a way that people end up winning elections with 97% of the vote. In other words, it's anything but free election where any candidate can register and anybody can vote freely for who they want. Instead, it was a Soviet-style sham election, and so a communist government was installed in Poland. Now, why did Roosevelt sell out Eastern Europe? He stopped Eisenhower and allowed the Russian army to advance all the way through Poland and through a good part of Germany. And at the Ulta, he basically said, yes, Poland and the rest of Eastern Europe can remain under Soviet control. Not directly, they weren't incorporated into the Soviet Union, but nevertheless, Soviet puppet governments were installed in those countries. Why did Roosevelt accede to that? Churchill was urging him not to do it, saying insist on international supervision. At this point, the Americans had the atom bomb. Russia didn't. The American army and the British army together were far stronger than what remained of the Russian army after the bloody battles on the Eastern Front. Why, from a position of strength, did Roosevelt give all this away? I don't think the answer to that is very clear. There are different theories. One theory is that by the time Yalta came around, he was ill. He died two months later. And so he was already a very sick man. Another view is that it was just his personality. He was too trusting. Even two years before, before he was that ill, after all, Tehran, he had trusted Stalin instead of Churchill. And so already, you might say, he was willing to say, these guys are allies, we can trust them, far, to a far greater extent than he should have. But there's another factor, too. One of his top aides, Harry Hopkins, was a Soviet agent. And it was revealed later that he was actually spying for Stalin. And so having one of your top advisors be somebody who's a spy for the other side, well, what well, was not here exactly the other side, still an ally, but was to become in the post-war world the chief adversary, that that person be an, an agent of the other side was a serious problem. In any case, the result of all of this was that Eastern Europe was dominated by the Soviet Union, and puppet governments were installed in the various countries of Eastern Europe. So Churchill summarized it this way in a famous speech where he coined the term Iron Curtain. Churchill said, from Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, an Iron Curtain has descended across the continent. Beyond that line lie all the capitals of the ancient states of Central and Eastern Europe, what I must call the Soviet sphere. And all are subject in one form or another not only to Soviet influence, but to a very high, and in many cases, increasing measure of control from Moscow. Here is how the post-war world ended up as a result of the agreement at Yalta and these post-war arrangements. The countries in blue remained with the Allies, but you can see the various countries in red there that ended up under Soviet control. Not only, of course, the Soviet Union, but Poland, East Germany, the area in which Roosevelt allowed the Soviet army to advance through, at the end of the war, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria. The country there in black is Yugoslavia, which ended up with a communist government, but one that was never really fully under Soviet control. Uh, Tito was the leader of the Yugoslavs, and it was said as a sort of joke at the time that in Yugoslavia there were so many million Croats, so many million Slovenians, so many million Montenegrins, so many million Bosnians, so many million Serbs, and one Yugoslavia. Tito himself. <laughs> While he was in control, he managed to unify Yugoslavia. The moment he was deposed and died, um, Yugoslavia fell apart into a variety of different countries, which it is today. The countries here in gray, Sweden, Finland, uh, Switzerland, Austria, Ireland actually, um, were all neutral, as it were, between the Western powers and the Iron Curtain countries. And you see little red lines across Albania. It actually fell under the control of communist China, ironically. <laughs> so it was a communist nation, but in no way affiliated with the Soviet Union. Well, in April of 1945, when Roosevelt died, his vice president, Harry S. Truman, became president. The S, by the way, stands for nothing. It's just S. <laughs> uh, he was a hatter from Missouri. Uh, from independence. He had a sort of odd political background. He had not really had much background in politics. Um, but he turned out to be actually a very transformational president, partly because he was confronted with a dramatically new situation and developed what became known as the Truman Doctrine to respond to it. One of his first acts was to purge pro-Soviet officials from his administration. It was not just 
Hopkins, there were a lot of people in Roosevelt's administration who were sympathetic with Stalin. Some were actually Soviet agents. Some were, at any rate, members of the Communist Party. Truman was concerned about that and tried to get rid of such officials as his administration. Henry Wallace was one of them. He leads a memo arguing in favor of unilateral disarmament on the part of the United States and increased trade with Russia. Hugh Truman, in response, fired him. Wallace ended up running for president in 1948 against Truman and against the Republican candidate Dewey, uh, but didn't really do much to sway the results of that election. There are things that are important in both foreign policy and domestic policies under Truman that I want us to discuss because he did define the shape of the post-war foreign policy of the United States. And also there were crucial issues involving the domestic scene, and in particular revolving around the House of Representatives and its Un-American Activities Committee. Truman did correctly recognize that there was a large degree of Soviet influence in the American government itself, and he took steps to try to counteract it. It took a little bit longer for the Congress to realize that this had been the case, and they began focusing on people both in public life and in private life who were thought to have communist sympathies or to be members of the Communist Party or in some other way align themselves with the Soviet Union. There was a tremendous amount of concern after the war about communist subversion. Not all of it misplaced. This was the time of the Hollywood blacklist. It was the time of the Alger Hiss case. Whitaker Chambers' book Witness is all about that case and its own role. Hiss, in any event, was a journalist who was accused of being a member of the Communist Party, in fact, an active high official of the Communist Party in the United States, and was accused of spying for the Soviet <coughs> Union. Whitaker Chambers was the per person who was his chief accuser. Chambers had been a communist who had been in a cell, not a jail cell, a Communist Party cell, with Hiss, and reported a variety of activities um, that they had engaged in actually before the Second World War, primarily. Eventually, Hiss was convicted, not of espionage, but of perjury for lying about his role in all of this, due largely to the strength of Chambers' testimony. This is a picture of Whitaker Chambers. As you can see, he was uh, these were unlikely combatants. <laughs> Hiss was sort of a, uh, a good-looking, well-spoken, upper-class sort of person. Chambers was not so attractive before the cameras. <laughs> um, but in any event, uh, there you see a picture of him once Hiss was actually found guilty. Anyway, what I asked you to read from Witness was that beginning letter called A Letter to My Children, where he talks about his own role about the case and puts it in very general civilizational terms. The Hiss case itself is complicated. The book is actually intriguing for getting a glimpse into what the Communist Party was like in the United States during the 30s and 40s and what happened to him once he went public with his accusations and so forth. He, in this letter, though, when he go, doesn't go into the details, but reflects, he describes the whole case as a tragedy of history, um, where people with a certain vision of the good end up coming into conflict. He, as he puts it here, two faiths were on trial. And he puts it in very stark terms, God or man. But really, it was a belief in, you might say, the American form of government, as opposed to a belief in communism. Anyway, he said, the world, the whole world is sick unto death. He's there referring, there's, there's an echo of Kierkegaard here. This case has turned a fierce light into the suddenly opened and reeking body of our time. And intriguingly, before he went to Congress to give his testimony, he read Dostoevsky and Bobby to prepare. Uh, so that's part of the reason they're actually part of this course. But in any event, that was really the background. Now, as a result of bringing these accusations against this, there was a tremendous campaign of personal destruction against Chambers, one that involved him losing his job, having to really live in isolation and hiding for a long period of time. Um, here is Hiss's lawyer, who is talking about Chambers and trying to destroy his character, saying he was a moral leper. Chambers is an enemy of your cause, a blasphemer of Christ, a disbeliever in God, with no respect either for matrimony or motherhood. He believes in nothing. There is not one decent thing that I can think of that Whitaker Chambers has not shown himself against. Roguery, deception, and criminality have marked this man, Chambers, as if with a hot iron. Now, those are pretty strong words. But since that time, we've seen this sort of politics of personal destruction again and again. Sometimes people blame it on Saul Alinsky and his 1960s book, Rules for Radicals, that tells radicals to personally destroy the enemy, freeze a target, personalize the fight, um, and destroy that person. But actually, as you can see, it goes back well before this. 
Chambers was exposing um, this uh, spy network, but also the Communist Party network, and so he had to be destroyed. And there was a huge amount of personal attacks against him. You can probably think of others who have been subjected over the past years to that kind of personal attack, a sort of personal level of hatred. Um, I don't want to get into <laughs> contemporary politics particularly, but I will say I heard a Harvard professor one time insult one such person who really became a sort of target of, you might say, um, this kind of hatred. And uh, I said to her, well, what's so bad about this person? I don't really understand why this person is so hated. What's wrong exactly? What's wrong with this person? And it was intriguing. She, she, she became furious with me. I mean, she was so angry she could barely speak and couldn't really answer this. I was in Denmark at the time at a conference, and there were a bunch of Danish people there who had no particular feelings about American politics, and who later told me they were intrigued by this. <laughs> Say, you know, you were so unemotional, but that person became so emotional about this, she couldn't actually explain anything. And I said, yes, well, yeah. <laughs> but this is what on earth had Chambers done to deserve all of these epithets? Well, nothing really. I mean, there he was, right? He doesn't look like a blasphemer and all these other horrible things. What on earth had he done? But it didn't matter, in a sense. There was a, ca a campaign of character assassination. Now, Chambers, since he had a history in the Communist Party, has a very interesting perspective here, because he tries to say, look, it's important that we understand both the attraction of this worldview, but also what's wrong with it. That's why I describe this as a battle between ways of reconstructing normativity he says it would be easy to say, ah, oh, I believe in norms and the other person doesn't, which is just what his said, his defenders were saying about Chambers. Ah, oh, we believe in values, we believe in norms, and the other guy doesn't. Instead, Chambers said, look, there are two sets of values here. There really are values, they're just different than they're opposed. He recalls Marx's 11th thesis on Florida. The philosophers have only interpreted the world, the point is to change it. And he says, look, well, why would somebody be attracted to communism in the first place? Partly. By the way, in my other classroom, that there is a heating and air conditioning unit in the room that is constantly making that kind of noise all the way through the class. It'll be quiet for maybe, I don't know, three or four minutes, and then it starts going. I mean, in this really sort of highly annoying thing, and it like keeps going, and then after a minute or two of that, it'll stop. It's driving us all crazy. At least it's better than earlier in the term, it was always over 90 in that room. There was one day when it was 97 degrees outside, and we opened the windows to cool it down. <laughs> but anyway, when it's not overheating the room, it's just making these hideous noises. In any event, back to Chambers and this. He really says, look, in the end, what we've got here is what he describes as the second oldest faith. Ye shall be as gods. And he says, that's the attraction. I mean, why would somebody find Marxism as appealing? Maybe because they personally feel oppressed, maybe because they're struck by great inequality and so on. But he says, emotionally, really, this is the appeal. It's saying, we can redesign society. The attraction is, ye shall be as gods. Let's reconstruct society as human beings on rational lines. And so he says, here's the vision. And you can tell when he's writing about it, he still feels the attraction. He says, it's the vision of man's liberated mind by the sole force of its rational intelligence, redirecting man's destiny and reorganizing man's life and the world. So the thought is, look, we are rational beings. We can be in control of our own lives. We can be in control of our lives together. The world as we find it doesn't make much sense. It involves all these things that seem handed down to, by tradition for no particular reason. It also seems unjust in various ways. But hey, we can redesign. We can knock it down and rebuild. Think of that image that we saw, we've seen in Shaw with the Fabian Society of remolding the world, of people there with hammers smashing the old world and rebuilding a new one. And he says, look, it's a very attractive image. We can say, let's forget about this. Let's remold the world in our own image. We shall be as gods. We shall be the ones who actually reconstruct things in a way that makes sense. And he says, look, it's a powerful sort of appeal. It's not a trivial thing. And it really is a kind of normativity that says rationality is enough. If we just reconstruct the world on rational lines, then that's all the norms we need. After all, it was part of the Enlightenment project to rebuild a sense of norms on the facts of rationality, 
to say what it is to be moral is really in the end just to be rational. And he's saying that's the drive that lies behind communism and other forms of socialism. It's that attempt to reconstruct the world uh, in a rational fashion. Well, if that's true, and if he still feels the attraction of it, then why turn away? And he describes actually a friend here who ends up leaving the Communist Party, but he says it reflects his own experience too. This friend was saying one night in Moscow, he heard screams. That's all. Simply one night he heard screams. And Chambers said, when something like this happens, the person who turns away then <laughs> hears them for the first time. They don't merely reach his mind, they pierce beyond. They pierce to his soul. And so at some point he says, yes, I've had this vision, this vision of reconstructing the world on this rational and just foundation. And then, one time, I hear screams. I realize, in other words, the human suffering that's involved. I think about, maybe, the fact that Stalin actually ordered collectivization and tries to redesign the entire Soviet Union, leading to the deaths of maybe a hundred million people. All of that done in his study, without any actual study of agriculture, without ever going into the fields to see how it was working out. A decision gets made in somebody's office, a hundred million people die. That's a sort of abstraction. But you get confronted with one person, you hear one scream, and you suddenly realize the amount of human suffering that's involved in this attempt to destroy the old order and rebuild the world. Now, when confronted with this sort of thing, we've seen the reaction that, well, uh, gosh, you have to break a few eggs to make an omelet. That was Walter Durant's view in the New York Times. Well, yeah, some eggs are being broken. Orwell responds by saying, yeah, but where's the omelet? <laughs> But, in a sense, Chambers' reaction is different. Not, where's the omelet? But instead, listen, you're talking not about breaking eggs, you're talking about breaking human lives. At some point, you hear the scream, and you can no longer rest content with this vision of a fully rational world. In any case, he ends up being inspired by Dostoevsky. He says, in the end, the conflict really is God or man. Now, why does he see it that way? Well, it's for a different reason, I think, from the reason that Dostoevsky had. In Dostoevsky, we've seen what I call the paradox of the anointed. The idea is this group of people think that they are the ones who understand the rational structure of things and are actually capable of acting as gods and rebuilding things in their own image along rational lines. They see themselves as being in this position to lead, but they do it by virtue of the fact that they think they understand this hidden level and can do it fully rationally. The problem is, there aren't any norms at that level. They cut themselves off from the very values they would need to make decisions as they reconstruct. And so he thinks, in the end, they have nothing to go on but their own desires, their own prejudices, their own visions. In short, they become narcissists, and there is nothing for them to actually use to guide their reconstruction. In Chambers, there is a different vision. He thinks, look, they do have a vision. It's not that there's nothing beyond what's in themselves. They really do have this enlightenment vision of a rational world. They think, aha, we've discovered laws of science that suggest that the natural world is really law-governed. Why isn't the human world similarly law-governed? Maybe we can understand those laws and actually reconstruct it along with those laws in such a way that it is a just and sane and rational world. A world ruled by the mind of man, by, by reason, ultimately. And that really is a moral vision. But now, if that's a moral vision, what exactly is wrong with it? If, if it's not Dostoevsky's analysis, what's wrong with making that choice? Well, yeah, I'm really asking. <laughs> yeah? Well, if going to a special world requires so much suffering, it would turn a lot of people. Well, good. In the end, yeah, I think for Chambers, in the end, it is simply the screens, right? What's wrong with reconstructing the world on these rational lines? Part of it, I think, is that, look, we're not fully rational animals, <laughs> and so to try to build, rebuild the world on rational lines is never going to succeed. We aren't really entirely rational beings, even if in some respects we are. Part of the story is that we don't know enough to do it, and so we're not really going to successfully put it together. But a huge part of the story is exactly what you said. It is the screams that, in the end, doing this involves destroying millions of people's lives. And for what? For a goal that you claim is going to be better, but in practice, gee, never seems to be. And so, 
eventually he realizes, look, the cost is too high. Even if in the end it could be done. Even if the end, in the end you could know enough to do it. Even if in the end human beings are rational enough to actually be happy in this rational world you think you're creating. The fact is, the destruction required to get there is so great that in the end it would never be reasonable to do it. It would never be reasonable to destroy lots of actual people's lives for the sake of this potential vision. Yeah? So it's kind of like a Dorian Gray it would be like once to be a moral of the meaning age, but what does that mean to the end result that Ian like how that look is really bad because that's getting dies and so what does that mean for the future? Well what's the connection exactly? So like And so, to understand the world, it's really alien to us. But, gosh, the rules of society and of the human mind, you might think those should be intelligible to us, and something that is under our control. After all, we create societies, and we have thoughts. And so surely we can control our own minds, surely we control the, could, should control the shape of society, and so the thought is somehow all of this should be more intelligible than the natural world, easier to control, more amenable to being brought under rational control. And so we should be able to set up a system that lasts in a way that ordinary societies don't last. So eventually civilizations collapse, eventually governments collapse. But if you had this fully rational system, wouldn't it go on and on? And Chambers says, yeah, I saw that vision, that's why I joined the Communist Party. But here's why I got out of it, because I started realizing the cost. Because I started recognizing that wait, uh, even if the vision could be achieved, even if it were real, it involves so much suffering to get there that in the end it isn't worth it. So in that sense, yes, it's a similar kind of realization that there's this vision, and it's an immensely attractive vision, but in the end, a sort of fatal vision, one that actually would pr produce an immense amount of suffering. Now notice, Chambers was in a position high enough in the Communist Party to actually know something about the, suffer the suffering introduced under Stalin. That's something that not everybody was in a position to know. I want to talk a little bit about the thought of Friedrich Hayek um, last time I taught the course, this was actually one of the assigned books. It's not this time, but I want to say a little bit about his arguments, because in part there was an intellectual movement to fill in the details that Chambers is leaving out from a theoretical point of view. He's telling his own personal story, and he's telling you why he both joined the party and then later turned against it and gave evidence against it. Hayek gives more intellectual arguments for what's wrong with this attempt to rebuild the world on rational lines. As soon as the war ended, Churchill was thrown out, actually, as Prime Minister of Great Britain, and a Labour government was instituted instead. Basically, as long as people felt safe, they said, well, forget the Conservatives, now we'll replace them with a party that was dedicated explicitly to socialism. And Hayek was one of the main voices against this. He is part of the Austrian School of Economics. He ended up winning the Nobel Prize in Economics um, for his views. And his book, The Road to, so to, the, to Serfdom, is a kind of critique of socialism. He's the guy who came up with the definition we've been using in the course of socialism as a conscious direction of social forces to consciously chosen ends. He sees that as the essence of this rational vision that Chambers is talking about. Yes, an idea of rebuilding the world rationally, where we rationally and consciously choose the ends toward which we together will work, and then we rationally choose the means to those ends. We do this consciously together. Well, it is a vision of the collective good and of a rational choice among collective goods. And so you might say this is a reasonable thing to do to pursue the good of society as a whole. 
But now, there's a certain traditional response to this that says, well, yeah, that's a fine goal, but, but it actually requires a great deal of individuality. It requires spontaneity. It requires that people be left alone to do their own thing. That was the argument of John Stuart Mill in On Liberty. He basically said, yes, we should pursue the collective good, but the best way to do it is to turn people loose to pursue their own private goods, and then the collective good will emerge out of that. It is really just the sum total of all those individual goods. And so that's one way of taking this, to say, yes, of course, hence the case for liberty. But that, of course, isn't what the Communist Party did. It's not the kind of thing that drew some chambers in. Instead, it was this vision that, wait, no, we should be doing this together and consciously. I shouldn't be leaving you to pursue your own ends while I pursue mine. Instead, we should get together and choose our collective ends rationally, and then choose the means to those ends. Now, Hayek says, look, <laughs> in the end, inevitably, that makes socialism the enemy of spontaneity, the enemy of individuality, the enemy of liberty. And so in the end, he's saying you really have to choose. There's the John Stuart Mill path of letting people seek their own goods, and then letting that add up to a social good. Or you have to say, no, we will together <coughs> decide upon means and upon ends, and then other people have to play their part. Well, if they have to play their part, then in a sense you've got to limit people's liberty because you've got to force them to work for those collective ends. And so in the end, his famous slogan is socialism means slavery. Why? Because it's substituting the collective judgment about what's good and what means are appropriate for getting there for your own individual judgment. Now here's the positive part of Hayek's case. It's pluralism, really. He says in the end, goods differ in kind. They're just different kinds of things we care about in society. So if we talk about the common good or the general welfare, he says, look, that doesn't have very definite meaning. It doesn't have enough to determine any course of action. In fact, he says, in society, we care about lots of different things. So give me your ideas about what a, a good society would be. A good society would have certain characteristics. And what would some of them be? Let's talk about the common good, the general welfare. What would be components of the general welfare of the common good? Yeah? Okay, good. So equality in certain respects, uh, respect for liberty, respect for property, education. What are some other things? Uh, freedom of expression. Freedom of expression. Good. What else? Strength. Strength. Yeah, strength. Good for individual, good for us together. Uh, <laughs> sorry, whenever I do that sort of thing, I don't. Yeah, never mind. Okay, <laughs> I'm always imitating Arnold Schwarzenegger. But I realize I don't really do a German accent. I just do an imitation of The Simpsons doing an imitation of Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> anyway, never mind. Go ahead. Social capital. Good, social capital. So a, a great deal of trust, cooperation, uh, those kinds of bonds and networks that enable people to work together. What are some other characteristics? Do you want your people to be healthy or to be sickly? Do you want them? healthy, right? Do you want your people to be smart or to be stupid? <laughs> do you want your air to be dirty or to be clean? Um, do you want your country to be peaceful or do you want lots of war? Do you want to be safe or do you want lots of crime? There are lots of different dimensions, right? And so Hayek says, look, yeah, we care about all these kinds of things. We care about health, we care about safety, we care about prosperity, about security, about freedom of expression, about respect for property, about all these sorts of things, about equality, about very, very many different dimensions. There are different kinds of things we care about. And so to pursue the common good means to choose among those goods, to try to evaluate them. But sometimes they come into conflict and we have to make hard choices. So he says, look, <laughs> If we could just talk about the common good, it would mean we have some common scale on which to rank all those various things to say exactly how security compares to liberty, compares to freedom of expression, compares to equality, compares to education, compares to this and that and the other thing. And we don't have it. He says, look, even if you did, it would be so complex that no human mind could grasp it. We all have individual trade-offs we're willing to make, but we place different values on these various things we see them as differing in importance with respect to the common good. We don't share any vision of how they're to be compared, but even if there were an absolute and right way to compare them, it would be hugely complex, and it would be very hard for anyone to understand it. There's another problem. He says, as soon as we get together and try to decide things together, we've got a difficulty. Who is going to give direction to who? After all, in this kind of society, 
People are going to have to decide to use resources to actually address certain ends. Well, who decides? Who gets to make the decisions about what the ends are? Who gets to decide what the means are? Who gets to actually implement it? Who gets to assign you your role in it? Well, they said, there's a huge issue here. People have to direct either themselves or people get directed by others. Who's going to direct who here? Who's going to take what from whom and get it to whom in order to actually promote a greater sense of justice or equality, for example? Well, in a sort of vision of freedom, the John Stuart Mill vision, nobody's really doing this. We're each making those decisions and trade-offs on our own. However, if we make conscious and collective decisions about these things, individual is getting transferred away from the, or power is getting transferred from the individual to the state, to somebody else. And so either you get to choose how to live your life and how to dispose of the resources available to you, or somebody else gets to do it. And so really, in the end, the question is, you get to make decisions about how to live, or somebody else makes them for you and assigns you your role. Now, so far we haven't answered the question, why the screens? So why does it turn out that there's a ter terrible cost in human terms? Why do some people suffer? Why do we find in the Soviet Union 100 million dead? So why the screens? Well, here's the problem in part. <laughs> people do have different views. They have different tastes. Okay? Some people are going to want to work for this common vision that people outline who are at the top and who are getting to make the decisions. Other people aren't. Okay? And so, to the extent that you've got this forcing people into this sort of role, you've got to force people to give up their vision and instead adopt the common vision. You've got to get, force people to give up their own rights to decision making and instead adopt somebody else's verdict on what they should do. Moreover, you've got to construct some kind of common scale. But to do that, given the complexity of the problem, you've got to, in the end, go for the least common denominator. So in the end, Hayek says that the people who are at the top are going to be making decisions on the basis of the most simplistic understanding, and actually the most negative understanding, since people will unite more about a negative program than they will on a positive goal, easier to find scapegoats to attack than to find a positive vision to work for. But moreover, who will be on top? The people who are the most, ruth most ruthless, the most willing to substitute their judgment for those of others. And so he has a chapter entitled, Why the Worst Rise to the Top, which says, look, the people making the decisions are never the ideally rational agents that you envision. They're always the worst people to be making those decisions. He has one, uh, well, actually, he has several other arguments, but I'm bogging down here, so I'll go fast. <laughs> In the end, he says, look, Here's what happens. If you're working toward what is identified as a common good, then you fully count as an individual, you get respected. But if you don't, you don't get respected. You're working against the common good, as Wilson would say, you're working against the health of the organism. And so in the end, you don't really count. You aren't treated with respect. Your dignity isn't recognized. In any event, let's go from this theoretical discussion to practical questions. After the activities of the Truman administration to weed out communists from the government, and then after the activities primarily of the House Un-American Activities Committee under Truman, Senator Joseph McCarthy became famous for having lists of people in both private and public life who were affiliated with the Communist Party. In 1950, he made headlines just two weeks after the his verdict with claims that he had a list of members of the Communist Party working in the State Department. Now, there really had been a lot of people with communist sympathies working in the Roosevelt administration, but Truman had already gotten rid of them. So to the extent that this was good information, it was also outdated information. In any event, he ended up going on a multi-year campaign against people he identified as communists on thinner and thinner evidential grounds. Eventually, McCarthy became an enormously unpopular figure. He largely drank himself to death. Um, and well, yeah, what do we say about this whole episode? I'm not going to go into many details here. I'll just say, in the end, few people were really punished. Those were punished very lightly. On the other hand, a lot of people's livelihoods were affected, like the people on the Hollywood blacklist and so on. And so to say they didn't go to jail is one thing. To say they didn't suffer serious consequences is another. A lot of these people did suffer serious consequences. McCarthy ended up being censured by the House, and the Un-American Activities Committee became very unpopular. Um, one of the things I think all this shows us is the inadequacy of libel laws. It turns out to be remarkably easy to destroy somebody's character, to engage in a campaign of character assassination and get them into big trouble, big enough trouble to lose their job, 
and so on for a belief that they may or may not have, for political affiliation, for all sorts of things. Another thing is institutional cowards. You might think that Hollywood studios or companies or other agencies would actually stand up for their people and defend them. To a large extent, this is not true. Okay, allegations get made. You might think your friends will come to your defense. Your boss will come to your defense. Your institution will defend you. Ha, huh. no, it doesn't tend to happen. It did a lot to undermine anti-communism and in fact developed a sort of attitude of anti-anti-communist that the people who were vehement about opposing communism were themselves to be feared. And so in that way, McCarthy really did a huge amount of damage to the cause he was trying to work for. And finally, it led, it, it posed a serious blow to moral confidence. In a sense, after the war, people thought there was a very clear sense of right and wrong. You might say there was an initial and very simplistic attempt to revive normativity, saying, look, Hitler was bad and we were good. And now Stalin's bad and we're good. Okay, and it was a very simple idea. The McCarthy era showed, look, it's not that simple. <laughs> some very good people are on both sides. Moreover, some of the tactics people are willing to use on both sides are quite unpleasant. And so it tended to, in some cases, promote a kind of dialogue of moral equivalence, but at the very least was a sort of blow to moral confidence and a suggestion that it was much more complicated. I'm going to skip some things here and go to the Truman Doctrine. Here you see Truman sitting down with Chir Churchill. The two of them were closely together, and so it was a dramatic change from the attitude of the Roosevelt administration. Here is what Truman said in helping to define his doctrine in his famous speech. One of the primary objectives of the foreign policy of the United States is the creation of conditions in which we and other nations will be able to work out a way of life free from coercion. So that was the key. It's not only that individuals must be free, countries must be free to determine their own destinies, and they have to be able to live free from coercion. In the photograph there, you see him talking to Eisenhower. Here, I believe that it must be the policy of the United States to support free peoples who are resisting attempted subjugation by armed minorities or by outside pressures. And so he committed the United States to defending uh, nations that were under threat by communism. Now, at this point, Eastern Europe was already gone. But there was a worry that communist expansion would include other nations. And he said, we must assist free people to work out their own destinies in their own way. He was responsible for the Marshall Plan to rebuild Europe. And that really led to the very rapid re recovery of various countries who had been destroyed by the war, including those on the other side, including Italy and Germany. His first test was the Berlin Airlift. St Berlin was divided into four sectors, just as Germany itself was divided into four sectors. Even though the city of Berlin was within the Soviet sector of the country, there was a Soviet sector, East Berlin, and then West Berlin consisted of the French and British and American sectors. Stalin, since he had it surrounded, shut down the only road that went to West Berlin and tried to impose an embargo to start it out, essentially a siege. The response of the Truman administration was the Berlin Airlift flying supplies into Berlin to keep it safe and to keep it supplied. The result of that was actually the establishment of West Germany as a separate country, and also the establishment of NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. There was a firm US commitment to preserve free institutions and to maintain a strong enough military to do that, and then also a policy of containment. Containment was actually a policy drafted by that man, George Kennan, and it basically said, we must exert a long-term patient but firm and vigilant containment of Russian expansive tendencies. The application of counterforce, not everywhere, but at, at constantly shifting geographical and political points. The first of those that was major was the Korean War. We're out of time. Next time, we'll return to talk about that and talk about various developments in society's problems.